Before we start, there is a new video up on the Moiski Live channel. Also going to stream on Twitch later about 7pm GMT if I get back quick enough. I'll either stream Vermintide 2 or Rocket League, I haven't made up my mind yet. Now the subjects I want to talk about today, there are two of them. Involve one that's a bit of a moral dilemma, and the other that, well, many are calling the pussy pass. So the first one involves unnamed people. There is a reason for it, we will get to it momentarily, where a man is suing his wife for every penny she has, after discovering the eight-year-old son that he had been raising was not his, with High Court Judge Justice Cohen saying that the child cannot be told about any of this until the time is right. Now, I would argue there's never going to be a right time. That kid is going to be affected regardless, unless the father has no contact with the child from the day they found out they were not the father, and therefore distanced themselves until the kid realised something was amiss, or the kid finds out anyway. It's always going to be quite tricky. After discovering that the wife had had an affair early on in their marriage, the husband took her to the high court. Understandably, the father has since been barred from publicising the name of the real child's biological father. I also wonder if perhaps there's a restraining order, just in case. He also wants damages to compensate for distress. This is an interesting argument, because on one hand you have a man that has raised a child that is not his, while believing the child is his. But then on another hand you have a man that has raised a child. The deceptive element is the problem. Had she been upfront earlier on, this whole scenario would not have escalated to the point where it is now. A point where, quite frankly, while I accept that he has been absolutely duped by somebody that cheated on him, the person that suffers the most from all of this isn't him for being used, it's the kid that's been led to believe that that man is their father. I would say, and it should be pointed out, I live by a certain set of rules. I always believe that one man creates you, and that same man can be the one that raises you, but your dad is the one that creates you and your father is the one that raises you. If they happen to be both, one and the same, fantastic. If the man that created you wasn't the one that raised you, then that man isn't really something I give a damn about. Therefore, an argument can be made that the man who's seeking compensation is the young boy's father. I'm almost certain someone is going to disagree with me on that, and quite frankly, you're welcome to, that's fine. It is just my opinion on it. I say it from personal experience, mostly. The judge made the ruling that a social worker would give advice and decide when the boy should be given the information. Mr. Justice Cohen has outlined this decision in a ruling that has followed many, many hearings and private litigations in a family division of the High Court in London. So understandably, no one can be named by the media. During the litigation, it has been argued by both the mother and the not dad whether or not the boy should be told who the biological father is. The man says he should, the estranged wife says no. I do believe there is an argument to be made that the child should be told at some point. At the age of eight, perhaps not. But I do also want to point something out, something that had only occurred to me a moment ago. The man and wife are now separated, or are in the process of separating. Therefore, all responsibilities he had to that child, because the child is not his and he has taken the decision to distance and want the kid to know, he has no responsibilities and no influence or impact he shouldn't have. Because he's made the case now that he wants compensation, it's likely and highly likely to believe he is not interested in seeing that child anymore because he's not the child's father. Although I still think, to an extent, he was the kid's father based on the fact he raised that kid for eight years. That's quite a lot of formative years to be looking after somebody that isn't yours. With the wife now being regarded as estranged, and being quoted as saying she's full of remorse, I'm very much interested to know what you think about this particular story. Because for me, yeah, there's a moral murky area. I don't think the kid should be told yet, but I don't think you should leave it too late. Let's not forget here how teenagers typically take that kind of information. It is quite psychologically damaging. So there never is a good time to tell them that the man that raised them for eight years isn't the man that created them. Let's not forget here that the kid will also then realise, wow, my mum's a slut, but that doesn't matter, in the grand scheme of things anyway. I'm also interested to know what you think about the claims for compensation. 
do you believe this man is entitled to any for being duped or not? I myself am unsure, which is why I'm okay to ask you guys. I think given time, this might have a ruling when it comes to compensation, but I'm not sure what kind of compensation can you get from somebody in these circumstances. Are you going to have all the receipts for all the things you bought the child? Under the pretense of you now saying they're not my child? This could set a very dangerous precedent, by the way. Not just for those who have obviously been duped, because that would make some sense. But for those who are step-parents who spend money on kids and then separate. And then decide, I want my money back. So I think it's quite interesting. The second story I want to cover involves a mother who lied a little bit to the tune of about 10 grand. She claimed she couldn't walk or go to the bathroom without help. In doing so, she managed to get £10,000 in disability benefits despite working full-time as a <sighs> crime advisor. Kind of sounds like a knockoff a Q Poirot, but what do I know? Is she Belgium? Does she have a moustache? With no level of irony to what she does for a living for the Staffordshire Police HQ, she was seen on their CCTV footage walking up two flights of steps, walking along footpaths, in fact, doing many things that she should not be able to do without any level of assistance. After pleading guilty to charges of falsely claiming the allowance, which would include disability living, employment support, and housing benefits, she was sentenced to 12 months in jail, which was suspended for two years. She was also ordered to pay 1,800 instead of the 10 grand, in installments of £50 a week, and then complete a 30-day rehabilitation program, until the lady in question has some issues, which of course are now at the forefront of why people think, hmm, maybe that was why she got a pass. See, she has PTSD after serving in Iraq, and is suffering from another few medical issues. It always is the case that when somebody commits a crime, mental health is brought up, and it's understandable because mental health is incredibly important. There is a trend that when it comes to female criminals, let's go with that, the pass always seems to be on mental health. That same does not apply to men. That does appear to the majority of people to be sexist, biased, misandrist, whatever you want to call it. I personally believe in individual cases being treated individually as opposed to the group, but then others will take that and correlate it all regardless. I do think if she stole 10 grand, she should pay back 10 grand, not 18% of it. That's not how this works. If I knew that, I'd rob a bank and just give them back 18% of what they had in their vault. Because all I'd get in return is a 30-day rehabilitation program and a suspended sentence. It's just ludicrous, really, isn't it? With her claim, she had failed to inform the Department of Work and Pensions that her health had improved and had even gone so far as to lodge a dishonest claim so that she would be awarded the highest rate of payment. Oh yes, I get it. With the benefit system, a lot of people do have to, quote, play the game, because otherwise they get duped and they get stiffed. And I actually take no issue with that, unless you don't need it. In which case I take great issue with it. I have been on these benefits, well, job seekers and housing, but I needed it. In hindsight, I could have done far better if I'd played the game. I don't know, broken a leg or something, claimed I had a hip injury or something. Problem is, I can't lie that well. It's not in my nature to lie. So I lived on about five pounds a week for food only, which was quite tricky for four years. Difficult even. But you make do until better opportunities arise. Maybe my mentality is a little different. Honesty is important to me. It should also be noted before we finish that she claimed she had a carer for six hours a day, seven days a week. That was a lie. She fabricated the existence of another person. That is more fraud, I guess. It'd be great to see how those invoices were generated, by the way. Because somebody had to get paid for it, didn't they? And it is illegal in this country to do cash in hand without claiming it or declaring it. Hmm. Anyway, with this case, I'm interested. I will link both articles down below. I'm very much interested to know what you think about the first case because it is a bit of a murky one. The second one just highlights an obvious bias, and I think it's a little wrong to only make someone pay back less than a fifth of what they stole. So I hope you all have a lovely Wednesday, and thank you very much for listening.